DNSSEC and the web, uh, how to improve security and reliability for the web with DNSSEC. We're going to be looking at some DNSSEC, uh, what DNSSEC is in the first place, and then how it can be used to help improve some of the zero trust architecture that uh, when you're deploying new infrastructure. Um, I am John Franklin. I'm with a company called Bixel. Uh, we do a lot of federal contracts, uh, mostly focused on uh, human-centric kinds of things. Um, So, uh, even when we're doing things with like a DOD, it's even, you know, we try to be more human focused there, like you know, defense commissaries and move.mil instead of uh, kinds of things, things that are supporting the families. Um, we do an awful lot of different things, um, not just web development, but also Data science and analytics. So, you know, if you're tired of doing PHP and want to do a little bit of R, then you know, you know where to find us. And you know, we're always hiring. Good grief, are we hiring? <laughs> so let's do a shameless plug out of the way. Let's uh, do a short DNS primer just to get an idea of you know, what is DNS and, and how does it work. So, in general, DNS is uh, it's you know the domain name system. It is a way of getting more than just IP addresses, but primarily IP addresses for host names. And it's all done with, you know, it sends out a query, and from, you know, the end user, what you guys are seeing, send out a query, you get back an answer. So in this case, you know, the query is, where is, uh, what's the IP address for www.bixel.com? The answer that comes back is, the canonical name for www.bixel.com is boom, 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 cloudfront.net. Um, and you, this is, the query is sent to whatever local resolver you have, which is going to send it to something else. And there's really like three major kinds of DNS server out there. There is what's considered a forwarding resolver. This is probably something that you have in your router at home. Uh, your laptop will probably also have that. It just, whatever query it gets, it knows an upstream to ask and it just forwards it on, waits for that upstream to find the answer and then returns it back. It'll oftentimes cache something. So if you go to www.bixel.com, then you go back, it doesn't have to look it all up again. It'll keep it for five minutes or a day, whatever the, the time to live is set to. Uh, there are recursive resolvers. These are servers that when they get the answer, the, the question, they actually start doing a lot of different queries in order to say, actually try to find the answer and then return it all back. Uh, and then there's authoritative servers, which are when you're running your own DNS domain, that's where you're putting all the records, and that server is what's you know, saying, I know the answer, I am authoritative for this, here is the actual answer for www.pixel.com. Um, it's a little bit of nomenclature before we get into it too far. Domain is, in the DNS world, it is basically a namespace, you know, pixel.com, or even com itself is a domain. Uh, you can have subdomains under that. You know, if you have a finance group inside your company, finance.pixel.com, and it has a whole bunch of other hosts underneath it. Or, you know, if you've got a DevOps group, devops.pixel.com, and you've got all the DevOps infrastructure under that, devops.pixel.com can be its own domain. And it can also be, uh, the zone is a collection of all those resource records, um, a resource record being name maps to IP address, or name maps to a text blob, or a, a C name. Uh, all those individual records are collectively called resource records, and a collection of them is a zone. So if you're working with something like Bind, which is a very popular DNS server, they have zone files. It's just pixel.com, and here's all the different uh, DNS records inside of it. Whenever you guys are using something like Cloudflare or uh, AWS or, or yeah, any of those, and you're adding in different records, you're adding in resource records into a zone that's hosted by whatever DNS provider you've got. And, and yeah, as I just said, the resource records themselves are individual records inside the zone. So you know, the first one is, you know, dub, dub, dub is, one, two, three, four, and then the second one, uh, the mail exchanger for Bixel.com is named mx.bixel.com and has 
And in this case, they can have arbitrary uh, formats, although the formats are defined per record type. So in this case, IN means it's an internet address, it's a, a class that's in DNS. Uh, MX means this is a mail exchange record. This is, if you're trying to send mail to pixel.com, this is where you want to connect to, to to send it. The 10 is the priority, and then the actual name of it. You know, sometimes there's a dot at the end, and that's because there is a root zone that is dot. So technically, all domain names, all URLs, it's www.bixel.com dot. Because there's you know, that root zone that is the place where uh, it has the resource records for com, net, org, TV, gov, mil, you know, all those top level domains, they are all in a zone file somewhere and that is in the root zone hosted by, uh, uh, managed primarily by ICANN, uh, but they have a bunch of different DNS companies managing one or two servers of, of it. So let's go through a, a complete uh, recursive resolver request. So a recursive resolver gets the, hey, what's um, www.bixel.com? And the first thing it's going to say is root servers.net. There's A through M root servers. And that is where the dot, that root zone lives. So what's the uh, uh, domain, what's the IP address for www.bixel.com? And it's going to say, I don't know what the whole thing is, but I know com is over here at agtldservers.net. Go ask them. Okay, gtldservers.net, what's bixel.com? Don't exactly know, but bixel.com is over here at Cloudflare. Go check them out. Okay, Seth, what's bixel.com? Well, the real name for it is this thing over at Cloudflare. And at that point, uh, once you get this, then you basically have to start again with the whole process. <laughs> um, because of the caching, it ends up being pretty fast, and these messages, you know, the uh, DNS requests and, and responses, they were originally all designed to fit inside of a UDP packet. So in like one UDP packet there and back, uh, it's very, very lightweight. The most common kinds of DNS resource records out there uh, as SLA is start of authority. When you have a domain that is you know, a zone file, you have to say this is the zone file for pixel.com. Uh, and that's going to be in the start of authority. NS name server. Uh, the name servers for this domain are NS1, NS2. Uh, A is the IPv4 records. Quad A is an IPv6 record. Uh, TXT is a text freeform. If you've ever had to set up uh, an SPF record, you've probably used this. Uh, if you've ever had to do some like verification stuff, uh, Let's Encrypt uses it all the time if you're using the DNS verification to put up just a long cryptographic hash to, to be verified. Uh, MX, mail exchange, where to send mail, and you know this C name, which is a canonical name. Now, C name, you gotta be really careful with. You can't use a C name at what's called the apex. We can't C name Bixel.com itself because what C name says is absolutely every question, every query that you would send for this particular domain is actually over at this other host. It's, you know, use this one instead. Which means that if you do it at Bixel.com, then the start of authority is also over there. Though all the name servers are over there, the MX record, I mean, absolutely, you are basically delegating your entire domain to something else. So that's, whenever someone says, you know, you can't use CNAME at the Apex, it's because you're actually breaking your own DNS. So DNS was built to be a global distributed lookup engine. Uh, back in the, well actually I think like through the 80s, uh, there was a host.txt file that was managed by some guys. And if you were adding some more machines to your lab at a university, you sent an email to, to them and said, here's the new machine names and here's the IP addresses, please add it to the host.txt, and everyone would download it. And it worked fine for you know, a handful of machines, even for a few hundred, or, or, but it did not scale. And you know, nobody really expected it to scale. They just didn't have a solution. So they ended up building uh, the DNS system. Um, it was never built really 
in the first place with any kind of security in mind, and the reason was why. I mean, it's named to an IP address, it's public data, it's a phone book, I mean, no one encrypts the white pages. But the problem is that there is, you know, remember there's three pillars of security, confidentiality, which is uh, only those who have permission to read something can. People sometimes just confuse that with security, although security is really all three of them together. Uh, integrity, which is only those with permission can create data. And I mean, this is important when you're thinking, some good examples of that, the weather service is able to write uh, weather forecasts, but no one else. Anyone can read them, they're completely public, but a very few number of people can actually write a weather forecast. Uh, and installing libc on your Linux machine. Every application should be able to read that and use it. Only root should ever be able to update it. You don't want random applications updating libc, that, that gets bad fast. And of course availability, you know, what good is data that you can't access. So the problem that we had was uh, a problem of integrity with DNS. Um, in 2008, Dan Kaminsky discovered a cache poisoning attack. Basically, he found that if you pummel the DNS server enough and in the right way, you could inject a different record into the cache and that DNS server would then start just serving it out happily. So you wanted to set up a fake site for some company, you do that and then you just find the target that you want to really go there, poison their cache and the, uh, they get an IP address that is to a fake site, they don't know any better, and it just goes right there. So, I mean, this was so easy to do that he stood on stage and hit the button, and within five minutes, he had poisoned uh, the cache of, I mean, it was like really, really trivial. So they kind of fixed it by tacking on the port number to the uh, session ID, and so the, all that really did was make it 65,000 times harder to do. It didn't really fix it at all. Uh, and, that, and that's because trying to do it in a way that was backwards compatible with all the re resolvers out there just wasn't possible. I and mean, that was the best that they could do. So what they really needed was a way to verify the integrity of the data that's returned. Uh, you got to have some way of saying, I've got this answer for, you know, dub, 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 pixel, like, um, how do I know, no, no, without a shadow of a doubt that it's the actual IP address, that someone hasn't you know, tried to fool me. And the answer is, of course, digital signatures. Um, conveniently, about three years earlier, uh, RFC 4033 was written describing DNSSEC. Now all you have to do is get everyone to use it. That's kind of the hard part. Uh, how well do you guys understand uh, just in general encryption and digital signatures? Kind of, sort of? Okay, cool. A little encryption 101. So there are two major kinds of algorithms for encryption. There's what's called symmetric encryption and asymmetric encryption. Symmetric, you have one key and it will both encrypt and decrypt. Uh, do you guys remember ROP13? No, okay. <laughs> Old way of, of hiding information on, the, you know, keeping spoilers on, a, on the internet of old. Basically, okay, so it is the number them 1 to 26, um, rotate it by 13, take whatever you know, you're trying to say, rotate it by 13 letters, and you've got you know, something that you can't really read but is very easy to undo. That's symmetric because 13, move it forward 13, it's changed, move it forward 13 again, and it's back to the original. The same key, 13, works for both. Uh, asymmetric requires a key pair. If you've ever done anything with uh, GNU, um, GPG, or I mean even SSL certs use this, you've got a two. You create two keys: one that is a public key and one that is a private key. And something that is encrypted with the private key can only be decrypted with the public key. And the other way works as well. Public key encrypted can only be decrypted with a private. Um, and then there's a digital signature, which is take the whole of the, whatever message you're doing, uh, come up with a checksum for it, you just SHA-256 service or something. I mean, you've, the easiest way to think of it is 
take all of them, all the letters, one through 26, uh, add up all the numbers, and that's your, your signature. Then encrypt that with your private key and publish it out there. Anyone can decrypt it with a public key, but because they've decrypted it with your public key, they know without a shadow of a doubt that it came from you. There's no one else that could have generated that hash. They check the hash, uh, actually matches, you know, they recompute the hash from the file or whatever that they're reading the email. If it matches, then it's good. So what DNSSEC does is it adds those kinds of digital signatures to the resource records. Uh, the public keys get published as their own resource record so that you can you know, fetch that and uh, verify that the signatures are, are correct and, and actually owned by you, the domain owner. And in order to do that, uh, it had to add a handful of extra resource record types. Uh, an RRSIG, which is the resource record signature itself, uh, DNS key, which is the public key for uh, signing his own, a delegation signer, which is a way of, for .com to say, Bixel.com's key should be this fingerprint. And that way, .com can essentially sign that Bixel.com and, and give that uh, delegation of trust. And then there's also NSEC and NSEC3, which is ways of saying, well, we can sign the records that exist, that's easy. How do you sign something that doesn't exist? How do you return a, this doesn't exist, and here's a signature to verify it? And that's what the uh, NSEC records do. They basically say, from www.bixel.com to um, www.x.bixel.com doesn't exist. Anything between those two, here's a signature that, that says that. So DNSSEC queries, they get a little bit bigger because they have to return not just the main resource record, but the signature for it. And these numbers here are parameters for what does the uh, signing algorithm and the encryption algorithm use to create the signature itself. Um, and the reason we want to use this, cache poisoning attacks as we you know, were talking about, Redirect users before you can see them. They are really, really hard to detect because they one tend to be kind of localized. I mean, you might do it for, you know, some uh, local ISP and get everyone in a metropolitan area, but you can probably just as easily do it at a coffee shop if you know that you specifically want to target, you know, a particular person. Um, the federal government is working to enable DNSSEC across all of their sites, and I don't know if this is actually going to come up or not. <laughs> We'll come back to it. At any rate, they've got a, a, some nice charts of uh, the government sites that are mostly like you know, 80, 90 percent DNSSEC signed. Um, university sites, which are kind of 30 to maybe 40 percent of those are signed. And then industry, which is like DNSSEC, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, is it opening? It's trying to open like seven times. <clears throat> No, I don't think it wants to today. Um, there's a really nice tool called DNS Viz that will go through and show how all these things are, are being signed. This one here, uh, this is one that is signed properly. Shows the, the DNS key for uh, the root zone for, for dot. It delegates down to the DNS key for com, which delegates down to the DNS key for pixelsolutions.com, which is actually signs fairfax.pixelsolutions.com. Uh, if it does not go through, then you get NSEC free record from .NET saying www.pixel.net, not signed at all.
So now that we've got DNS records that are assigned and they're assigned from you know the root all the way down, which gives you, I mean, you think about roots of trust in SSL certs, you know, uh, whoever your certificate authority is, and you go into the browser and you look at the list of SSL root providers. Uh, there's a large number of them in there, and some of them are US-based, and you can really trust them, they're, they're good. Uh, some of them, the Hong Kong Post Office is a root uh, cert provider, and Firefox, Chrome, whatever, will trust the SSL cert from them just as much as they would from anyone here in the States. And there's really, without like poking into it and, and looking at the cert itself, there's no way that you can really tell the difference. Um, there's an awful lot of checks and balances inside of the SSL community to keep from rogue things getting put in there, but they sometimes slip in and foreign governments that are not so friendly to us may try to leverage that. It's certainly something that, you know, plenty of security guys are going, we should keep an eye on this. Uh, so, but with the DNSSEC, you know, the root is from ICANN uh, and that root of trust passes down to Com, Net, and Org and all the others and then down to whatever domains you have. And so it becomes a very strong, uh, trustworthy way of putting out some information. So with that, they've come up with a handful of extra resource record types to make things, say you can put out some secure information that you would want to do. Um, SVBC or SCVB and HTTPS resource records make it possible to say, if you're coming to buy site and for HTTPS and you're using HTTP2 or HTTP3, then HTTP2 and 3, you know, quick supports what's called encrypted hello. Uh, if you remember server name uh, indicator, when you're connecting to an SSL site, you have to send the name of the site in the clear to the server so the server knows what cert to hand back to you so you can then verify it. Well, they fix that in H2 and H3 by basically saying, when you connect to the server, there's going to be a host key. And you'll we'll encrypt, set up a, an encryption, uh, encrypted connection using that host key first. And then over that encrypted connection, tell me what site you're trying to connect to. And I'll give you the actual cert for that. So, and in order to do that, you need some encrypted hello data. And what they even extended it to say, if you're going for this, then yeah, go to the same place, but go to port 8443 instead. That's where we're going to have all the H2 and H3 stuff. If you're just going for the H1, then go to the regular port 443. And in fact, don't even go to the normal host. Go to the hosting dash legacy. So you can redirect them to a completely different server or a different port, depending on what kind of uh, what protocol they're coming in on. Uh, then they had also added Dane, DNS authentication of named entities. And it, it's using that uh, root of trust from uh, DNSSEC to extend it to system certs and keys and other things. So there's three or four that we're going to be talking about today. TLSA, which says, if you're connecting to this host, here's the fingerprint or here's the cert that you should see. And it might be the Let's Encrypt cert. You might actually have your own certificate authority. You might just you know, generate one, you know, the snake oil cert. But this specific snake oil cert is the one that you should be, should be seeing. So it, it keeps uh, people from creating rogue SSL certs and then setting up a, for, uh, a fake site with a cert that looks right. SSHFP, uh, you know when you SSH into a server for the first time, it always asks, do you want to trust this host fingerprint? And then it saves it in the, uh, known, host. In the, the known host. Right. Well, you can just take those fingerprints, publish them in DNS, and SSH will look that up and say, oh, hey, look, it, here's a fingerprint. This is the fingerprint that's being reported by the server. I'm in the right spot. Uh, this becomes really, really useful when you're trying to set up zero trust architecture for your, all your infrastructure. 
because every time that you blow out a new machine or a new VM, add the host keys to DNS for it, and your DevOps infrastructure will be able to connect in, you know, Ansible or whatever, connect in, configure it, manage it, and know for a fact that, yes, I'm getting to the right server. Uh, and then SMIMA, which is a way of saying, here, for this particular email address, here is the public key, here's the cert, the SMIMA cert for uh, signing of emails. So the TLSA, we'll go through that one first. Um, it's, it can be for either the name, there's four ways that you can do it. Um, it and it's you know, two by two. Either the name of the system itself, and you know, this is the cert for it, or this is, it should be signed by this domain. So you can create your own CA cert, and then just publish that over and over again. And say, you know, as long as it's published by, you know, signed by our CA cert, we're good to go. Uh, and then you can do it either by actually publishing the cert itself or by just publishing the fingerprint. Uh, if a web server sees it, it tells the web server, you must use SSL to connect. You must connect with an encrypted thing. Don't even bother with the port 80. Just go straight to 443. Uh, and in the same way that HSTS does that. And it doesn't have to be just for web. It works on mail servers up across 143. Uh, port 22, you can use SSL certs for SSH as well. Anything that will accept, that, that does TLS, you can publish it as a DNS record. Uh, SSHFP, connecting with the fingerprint. It just means that you don't have to worry about, you have to have, yes, this is the accepted put into known host. In fact, we can demonstrate that real quick. So first thing, you know, we'll do a dig. This is doing a query for fairfaxepixel.com, looking for the SSHFP record and you know, show the DNS sec information. And you have know, 80 uh, authenticated data, that flag is set. And there's six of them because it's for different uh, signature algorithms and, and uh, key loop types. And then the RSIG that covers all six of these to say this is an actual DNS, you know, this is the DNS sec signature for all six of these. And then when we actually try to connect to it, found six secure fingerprints in DNS, verified type four, matching key found in DNS. It just passes right through it. It knows that it has it. Uh, and generating these is really, really trivial. Copy pasting them into, you know, whatever DNS system you have may be a little harder, but it's just SSH uh, gen minus R and then the host name that you want to use. And then these are just the Those are what you just need to copy and paste into your zone file. SMIMA is, I don't know if any email clients actually support it yet. Uh, it can be really useful because trying to get SMIMA search, I don't know if you've ever tried to actually acquire one online. They're kind of expensive and they are really hard to get. Um, and part of that is because you can't just like get a, a CA cert and then start creating them yourself. Because then you could create Bill Gates at Microsoft.com just as easily as you could, you know, Mike Anello at Drupal Easy. Um, 
there has to be a lot of uh, protections to, to keep you from creating them. So, but if you're doing it through DNS, then it's only going to be for your domain. You cannot possibly publish a uh, NS MIME record for someone that is outside of your, do your domain. You couldn't do it for uh, Drupal Easy at all. The way that it gets formatted though is it is, you take the user's name, like you know, john.franklin, and then you do a SHA-256 hash of it, and it takes a part of that and sticks it in as, that's the host name. The downside of that is all lowercase john.franklin is probably what's gonna get published. If you put capitals in there, it's gonna miss it. Uh, for systems like you know, Gmail where dots are optional, where you know, John Franklin without the dot is just as valid as John dot Franklin or John Franklin plus test one, those don't get captured. It's only you know the very normalized whatever you publish, usually all lowercase, is the only thing that's there. The other thing is the way that the NSEC records work. It makes it possible to get a complete list of all those. Uh, SMIME certificates and the hashes. And if you know all the hashes, then you can probably start to guess, especially if you know any people at the company, what is their email address? You know, is it J Franklin or is it John Dot Franklin or is it you know, Franklin John? Try a few different combinations, then you can very easily figure out what someone's email address is, and then you can start doing like spear phishing campaigns against them. So, you know, in summary, I think we're getting kind of close. DNSSEC can better ensure that users get to your site just because it's signing the DNS data and making it, you know, uh, reliable and trustworthy. Um, it makes it possible with those HTTPS records to alias the apex of your domain to a load balancer somewhere. Uh, with the merging protocols like uh, HTTP 2 and 3 and uh, Quick, that need those encrypted hello. If they can pull the data from DNS to help set up that initial connection, then they can reduce a, a round trip uh, of, of TCP connections, and that will speed up connections to your site by fractions of a second, but just enough that it, it's useful. And also better secure the ops infrastructure of everything that's, that's hosting your stuff. Because you can publish like the SSHFP records and your, your Ansible and you know, other management tools can connect straight in without a problem. Your user, your admins can connect in without a problem. And if they start seeing, you know, do you want to trust this fingerprint? Because they never see it once you start publishing those SSHFP records, it'll actually be a flag that, oh no, I really should pay attention to this. This is something that's probably not right. So that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any questions? I got one. Uh, do you know of any, any browsers that are maybe starting to think about incorporating this DNS stack in terms of like visual indicating that something's been signed? Or I, no, I'm not. Um, I mean, they used to have the little green box for the uh, EV certs, and Chrome and Firefox have dropped those. Mm -hmm. So it's something that, yes, I think they should do. I don't know if they're going to ever bother because, as they saw with the EV certs, nobody pays attention to it in the first place. Right. I mean, it's hard enough to get them to look at the lock icon. How often, like, so if you publish, you know, a key, mm -hmm. does that, like, ever change? Like, but what's, like, the management, like, on that? Like, would it be, like, when you get a new server or something, your key changes? Uh, well, I mean, you can change it as often as you like, you know, like any other I record that you put in there. You know, how often do you change the IP address of a server? And then, of course, there's the same issue of once you've updated that, uh, IP address, how long does it take before all your users see it? So yeah, there is that DNS lag of, you know, it's not really lag, it's 
all the recursive resolvers and the uh, forwarding resolvers have cached data, and you have to wait for that to expire before the fresh new data is uh, available to them. Um, keeping your TTLs low will help that, and oftentimes companies will, you know, before they do a deployment, crank the TTLs down to like a minute. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can change it as often as you like, just like you can any other, any other record. Anything else? All right, well, thank you very much for coming. And I hope that this was uh, useful to you.